got all four colors. Wonderful. Well, I suppose I'll get started. Uh, my name is John Schilling. I do uh, spacecraft propulsion for a living. So when you all figure out how to get to orbit cheaply, I'll figure out how to get through the rest of the way. <laughs> uh, there were some questions about Basmir in a previous uh, session, so I'll talk about that first. And I will badmouth it a bit because it's a group of reasonably competent rocket scientists with an excellent PR department, therefore everything they do gets oversold. <laughs> and I need to throw a little bit of reality into it. So let's start with Basmir. I assume pretty much everybody has heard about it because they do have an excellent PR department. Mm -hmm. uh, here's what you actually get. You get a device called a helicon, which is a magic gadget for producing reasonably dense plasma at low cost, low energy cost. Uh, the magic is very, fairly well understood. We know the incantations, the right configuration of magnets. We can make the plasma. We push this into the second part which is the magnetic mirror fusion reactor. Oh wait, we don't have one of those yet. Until we get the magnetic mirror fusion <laughs> reactor, we get the electron cycloton resonance heater, which is basically just a giant microwave oven optimized for plasma. And somewhere off here is either a big solar array or a nuclear reactor of your choice. There's not a whole lot of difference at this stage. You just need a couple hundred kilowatts or more of electricity. <laughs> then we go to the magnetic nozzle. Generate plasma here. It's a low energy plasma generator, so it's not very hot. You put it in here, hot energetic plasma, expand it out the nozzle, and it produces thrust in about the same way as a chemical rocket. Problem, this part we know, this part with a fair bit of engineering can be made to work. Magnetic nozzle, if you look at it in more detail, you have a little bit of structure, and then you have magnetic field lines that go out like this, extending out and looping back. And then in the center, we have a plasma, which in theory does this, expands out, hmm. high velocity, thus thrust. Problem is, how do we know it doesn't do this and go backwards. Hmm. Plasmas like to follow magnetic field lines. The theory is, by the time you're out here, the magnetic field is weak enough, it can no longer get a grip on the plasma, and the plasma will then proceed ballistically. Uh, we do know, mathematically, there will be some acceleration which produces thrust. There will be some deceleration of the plasma out at the edge stage here where it's breaking free, which will produce drag, which we don't want. Right. really ought to be better than drag. The problem is, the biggest ground test facilities we have cover about this much of the system. So, we can test this part, we can test this part, we can guess about this part. Why can't we do this on the ground? What's um, the limitation right now? The physical we size of the vacuum chamber. Yeah. You'd need to build something like the size of that building over in Downey and suck all the air out of it. So we're almost talking the need is almost like in, an infinitely large uh, and nozzle, yeah. or somewhere close to that. <laughs> or and, the, and the if longer, we had better. a convenient, infinitely large supply of vacuum to test it in, gee, where could we find an infinitely large <laughs> supply of vacuum? Right. <laughs> <laughs> this really begs to be tested in this space. Because when you test it in the ground, you can quote whatever performance figures you like, and uh, Ad Astra has some pretty good performance figures. And there's always an asterisk saying, assuming that the stuff out here behaves the way we expect. All right. Um, Question? I was wondering how that would all change if that center box was a magnetic mirror fusion reactor. Um, you could get rid of the solar arrays in the nuclear reactor, but it wouldn't change the rest of the system at all. You so need the plasma? Yeah. You just need some way of dumping a whole lot of heat into the plasma. If you have a fusion reactor, fusion yeah. reactors sort of Handles generate heat and plasma to begin with. If you have an external power source, we know a couple of good ways to take electricity and turn it into heat in the middle of a plasma. Well, what would be the primary way to throttle this? Would it be by changing the magnetic field, um, thus you, changing you the would, expansion ratio, or would it be changing the amount of power input? You change the amount of power and the amount of plasma. Okay. And those are your two knobs to throttle. Okay. Wouldn't a stronger versus weaker magnetic field 
produce different results. That you're, you're talking about a very strong magnetic field to pull, you know, it almost give you reverse thrust in a way. Yeah. But there's going the to weak be, one. For any operating condition, there's going to be an optimal magnetic field configuration, which we don't quite know what it is yet. Okay. Question, what benefits does Vassner give over an ion engines, et cetera? Now that's a good question. Vasimir works slightly better than ion engines at very high power levels. Uh, there are some loss terms in ion thrusters that don't apply to Vasimir. On the other hand, this thing has a lot of overhead power going into the magnetic nozzle, just maintaining those stationary magnetic fields. And because of the scaling laws, this works very poorly at low power levels, anything below 100 kilowatts or so, which unfortunately is right where all the current demand is. We don't have anything with a million watts of power on orbit, and we aren't planning anything soon. There are a lot of customers who want 10 to 20 kilowatt thrusters, 5 kilowatt thrusters. Those are all ion thrusters or Hall effect thrusters. So what's the divergence between this and a regular ion thruster then? Just that uh, heat input? Uh, this is a heat engine. You heat the plasma and you expand it through a nozzle. Okay. An ion thruster, well, you all know how this works, so you would take a plasma source oh, and it's typically not a helicon, but it could be, and some people are working on that, so I'll just leave that part up there. And then we throw two grids, uh, the, ne the positive grid and the negative grid, and as the plasma gets out here, well, any ion in the plasma that drifts into here, it gets repelled from the positive grid, attracted to the negative grid, and it just goes shooting out like that. It's okay. an electrostatic device rather than a thermal device. So it's not expanded, it's just accelerated using right. that magnetic field. And then, obviously, electrons that go out into this region just get pushed right back into here, so you need a separate little cathode out here, that's just maybe a hot filament or a hollow cathode discharge that throws a few electrons out to neutralize the beam. This can be very efficient. It runs into problems with these grids located right in the middle of a high energy ion flux. Uh, and if you look at the mathematics of it, you want these grids to be very close together, a few millimeters at most. So they tend to erode, they short out. They're troublesome, but at least within a certain range we know how to make them work. And they deliver similar performance to a Vasimir, aside from the scaling issue. Isn't that so, just like regular capacitor behaves the same way? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, you can view this as a parallel plate capacitor yeah. with the dielectric being a plasma that moves. Okay. Uh, there's a third type of thruster called the Hall effect thruster. Uh, this is a device that really the Russians have developed since the 1970s. We bought the technology from them after the Cold War and have been playing catch up, but we have some pretty good ones of ourselves. That is very similar, but it dispenses with the grids. It uses basically, and there's no way to describe this in less than half an hour, but the short version is, you get rid of the grids, you take a magnetic field running across the page, and there's actually more of a, an axial configuration to it, and we just trap electrons in this magnetic field. Uh, electrons are tied much more strongly to magnetic field lines than heavy ions. So if you get the magnetic field strength right, you can trap a cloud of electrons in here. It acts as a virtual cathode rather than a physical grid. And it does pretty much the same accelerating function, but without any trouble having material grids in your ion flow. Uh, there are different operating regimes in which one is preferable to the other, but they're not strongly different. You can always, pretty much always replace an ion thruster with a hull thruster or vice versa and your system would still work. So um, so from what I'm getting, there's really no, um, no so that basically the Vassar doesn't give us any really much additional performance. It, it, it does not give us anything qualitatively different. Uh, you can get slight improvements, particularly like I say in a high power area. Mm -hmm. You get you know a few percentage points of efficiency. Uh, the preferred propellants are different. Ion thrusters like heavy ions, and typically we use xenon now, we could use krypton, we could use some metals even, uh, whereas the Hall effect thruster being a thermal engine uses light propellants like uh, you know helium, neon, stuff like that. That can have implications if you're using extraterrestrial resources. If you're launching from Earth, you just launch whatever propellant the thruster uses. If you're launching, if you're running from Mars, we don't know about xenon really on Mars. Uh, actually, we don't know much about anything on Mars, but. Uh, the Vasimir might have an edge there. We can get, at least get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and we know that that will work. 
Well, I've, heard, I've heard rumors that the specific impulse is about 50 times the regular ion thruster. I mean, you don't want that. You don't want that? Uh, here's a, a clue. Power is equal to thrust times G times ISP over efficiency. And actually, there's a factor two in there. If your specific impulse goes up and you keep your thrust the same, your power goes up. Or, if you look this up another way, if you say that your spacecraft has a fixed power level, your solar arrays are only so big, rearrange the terms, thrust equals power times efficiency and at two power times efficiency over GISP. So your thrust equals. ISP goes up, thrust goes down. But that's a, that's a good thing when you're doing inter interplanetary travel, when you have a limited amount of propellant and you want to get as much out of it as possible. If you have an infinite amount of time to go to Mars, you want your specific impulse as high as possible. Right. If you're planning to go to Mars in anything less than a couple of years, and you have realistic power supplies, by which I mean either solar arrays that we know how to build or nuclear reactors that we know how to build, you really don't want a specific impulse more than about 5,000 seconds. Because you won't get the thrust, or in order to get the thrust, you need to drive along so much power hardware that the additional propulsive performance is just being eaten up, consuming your, carrying your power supply. Yes? Would you be able to get there in under two years um, if you had uh, a cold fusion power source that we were talking about that, because we had, um, I put together a discussion about new energy possibilities and they were talking about these two Italian men that were working on. Okay, when you, when somebody can get to me with numbers for the actual power to weight ratio of a fusion power system suitable for space operation, we can plug it into this equation and there will still be an optimum specific impulse value. You'll never be a place where you want the specific impulse to be as high as possible because for any finite amount of power, you got to you got to get the thrust from somewhere. What's that equation called again? Uh, this is just the the efficiency equation is applied to an electric propulsion system. It doesn't have a, a fancy name, unfortunately. Uh, and you can get it by just applying conservation of energy and conservation of momentum together to the rocket jet. Okay. Well, so the the power and thrust is literally it's, it's proportionable. Yeah. It's okay. And for I mean, Vasmer gets the name of the variable specific impulse. There's a knob you can turn to just basically if you want more thrust and less power today, you turn your knob one direction, you want the more power and, or more ISP and less thrust tomorrow, you turn the knob the other direction. You can really sort of do that with the iron thrusters and the hall thrusters too. Not over quite as wide a range, but over the range that you need for real missions. So again, there's not a game changer there. But the takeaway from this is we've got several ways of turning electricity and propellant into thrust. And you know, thrust, power, ISP, you pick any two. And if you're limited in power, there's going to be an ISP that you want. And, and you can do the mission analysis, and you'll see this nice graph where So that equation generally just shows that no matter what, I mean, no matter how efficient our engines are or anything, there is a limit to yeah. how fast we can get there versus, you know, how much propellant we actually need for any given application. And it's just it's a matter of power at this point. Two no power, way to get power efficiency over GISP. Yeah. And, I don't like that you know, for a real mission, Okay, I'm losing the uh, ability to write on the whiteboard, apparently. I mean, I guess, I think it's Turn it over. convenience factor then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. Just, uh, I'm just still waiting for us to interpret it. No, I mean, no. <laughs> I, mean, I just don't like thinking about Earth when yeah. doing mm -hmm. calculations for rockets that don't go over near Earth or something. For any mission, it's just a comparison. you can do something yeah, like this, what, where here is your specific impulse, and here is your payload delivered. 
Yeah. Right. It's, it's and you're throwing right. real assumptions about what your power supply weighs and how long your customer will wait for the mission to be completed, how long your astronauts can survive on the trip to Mars. It will look something like this. If your specific impulse is low, you get no payload because all you're carrying is propellant. There's no room for anything left over. If your specific impulse is high, you get no payload because in order to meet your trip time requirements, you had to load up your ship with nothing but power processing hardware, solar arrays, nuclear reactors, radiators, whatever it takes to generate that power. Somewhere in the middle is a happy medium. For near Earth operations, and I include you know out to the moon, in you know 20 year time frame for realistic power technologies, you want about 3,000 seconds of ISP. For a Mars mission, you'd want about 5,000 seconds of ISP. And for you know, Jupiter, you might want 10,000 seconds, but I haven't done that trade. We've got options to do that. The other option is to ignore all this and use chemical rockets, which are in the 300 to 500 second ISP range. Well, it's not ignoring it. It's just placing it at some point on that graph that's probably yeah. closer yeah. to the lower ISP side, right? Yeah. Do we have any capability of reaching that, you know, that max point there? Is there any engine we're currently capable of that has that number? Uh, the ion thrusters work very well in the 3,000 to 5,000 sec second range. Okay. Hall thrusters sort of max out at about 3,000 seconds, but so you just basically high. just need more ion thrusters, like a lot of them placed yeah. everywhere. That would uh, be your really most good efficient ion thrusters would be good. A Vazimir, like I said, once you get up into the 100 kilowatts, uh, the efficiency will be a bit higher. Uh, and there are other options that people are working on. Uh, magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters, uh, field reverse configuration thrusters. There's a lot of good work being done out there. But what we lack is the ability to do this at high power levels, hundreds of kilowatts or megawatts, which is what you need for a manned mission. All the current experience is at you know, the, the 5 to 10 kilowatt level where the current customers are. And yes, you can bundle a whole lot of 5 to 10 kilowatt haul thrusters up and use that to carry your ship to Mars. Some degree of clustering has been demonstrated in the lab and even on orbit. Ultimately, you probably want something designed for the higher power levels. Whether that is just a bigger iron thruster, a bigger haul thruster, or something new like a Vazimir, isn't really a huge difference. Hall effect was proposed for the Jupiter IC Moon orbiter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that it, had a much larger power source. Yeah, they were assuming nuclear power. Uh, I'd also like to add, unless you're going beyond Mars, there's not a whole lot of difference performance-wise between nuclear power and solar power. Reason being, I mean, everybody imagines nuclear reactors are these things that generate humongous amounts of power, billions of watts. And yeah, you can build a nuclear reactor that generates billion watts of power. That probably one not too far from here. It is also very heavy, which means, again, all that power goes into just carrying the weight of power supply. Solar arrays, less powerful, but they can be fairly lightweight, just a thin film. If you're going beyond Mars, obviously your solar arrays drop off dramatically because there's not much sunlight. But between here and Mars, now flip side of that is if you're going to Mercury, why would you ever probably carry a nuclear reactor? You've got so much sun. <laughs> but we're it's sort of in the middle ground where the solar arrays we know how to build and the nuclear reactors we know how to build, roughly competitive. And you know, solar power is green, nuclear power is evil. Neither of those things really matter in orbit. But from the political standpoint, if you're trying to launch it from Earth, that might be sort of the edge. Well, so we don't have any control on the, you know, on the thrust side or the uh, propellant side because you know, propellant is the weight it is. We can't make it lighter for the amount we're carrying. Right. But on the other side, we do have control and could theoretically make the power systems that we need lighter to carry more power and, and generate more. Uh, whether it be from some fusion reactor of some sort or all yeah. these nuclear reactors that are more efficient um, yeah. or very, very, very large solar arrays. <laughs> yeah, if you increase the, the alpha of your power supply that's on the watts per kilogram, this curve starts to look like right. this curve. Right. You want a higher ISP and you get more payload. Agreed. So anything yep. that improves the performance of electric power supply, that helps us a lot. Okay, so, so then a higher ISP is a good thing if we 
if and only if you have the power supply to yeah. support. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in my last job, I had lots of people coming up to me and building and proposing thrusters that were you know, here or here and saying, look at this wonderful ISP I've given you. I give you 10,000 seconds of ISP. It's wonderful and twice as good as any other thruster you've got. And no, because we still have the power supplies that put us on this curve, and you want us to fly right there. Well, but they're generating the future technology for hopefully, you know, someone else will, will figure out that power solution. They'll ha we'll now have a higher ISP solution, and we can combine the two. And, uh, and so all, they, all they found one of the two parts of it. You have to have a realistic expectation of what somebody else will come up with in the power supply field. Uh, okay. Th there will be a point at which designing a high ISP thruster is just a complete waste of your time because <laughs> the somebody else to whom you delegated give me the magic power supply will not deliver. And you have to watch both fields and you have to deliver the You thruster. do, but both are equally important. I mean, Both are equally important, which means you have to watch them both. But it's, it's not worth saying that just developing one without the other is a waste of time. Uh, well, if you literally develop one without the other, You've wasted your time because you well, they're both in the other part of the agreement. <laughs> if you develop one and trust somebody else to develop the other, whether you've wasted your time depends on whether they come through. If you develop a thruster and the other guy doesn't come through with the power supply, then yes, you have wasted your time. <laughs> so you really do want to watch what the power supply people are doing, and the power supply people need to watch what the thruster people are doing, and they need to talk to each other, which all too often doesn't happen. And you need to coordinate, and you also need to talk to the missions people as to whether they're on this curve for a Mars mission or whether they're trying to do a lunar mission, which has, you know, say this curve instead. But you talk to the missions people, the power supply people, and the thruster people, and you get an optimum solution. If you just go off into your own sandbox and try to develop what you think is the perfect system, the rest of it won't come together. And since I've used up most of my time talking about advanced electric propulsion systems. I will say, uh, if you do this, if you put chemical rockets on this curve, first off, you save a bit because you don't have to carry much in the way of electric power, just a bit to open valves and the like. And second, you wind up right about here. You're not up, you know, okay, maybe here. You're carrying half the payload you would with an electric propulsion system, but it's still half. And it's just off-the-shelf technology, or near-off-the-shelf technology. x is going to get back to us with that hydrogen rocket. Well, until we run out of fuel that we can use, you know, uh, it'll happen one day. x going to get back to us with a hydrogen rocket. If we run out of hydrogen, we've got problems. <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah, the thing is, that with the chemical rocket, if your launch to low Earth orbit goes down, cost, goes down in cost by a factor of two, you just remove the incentive to do it in the advanced electric propulsion. Well, it's, it, it, you know, both will benefit from it, but you don't have to pay the upfront development cost of the electric propulsion. Right. Uh, and for some electric propulsion systems, that upfront cost has been paid. For others, it hasn't. As I said, we can cluster hull thrusters, we can cluster ion thrusters. So there's always some off the shelf electric propulsion options. Whether we go beyond that, and invest in the development of uh, gigantic hull thrusters or basimer thrusters or any of the other options. Uh, that depends on the mission and it depends on the competition. Chemical propulsion is a perfectly reasonable choice again, at least out as far as Mars. And it does not require miracles in chemical propulsion to do this. Pratt and Whitney would guarantee the RL-10 at a million dollars a shot and with a few process improvements, uh, electric valves or pneumatic in particular, we'd be happy and Xcorp probably wouldn't be getting money from ULA. <laughs> but uh, Pratt and Whitney last time I heard was charging 30 million a shot for that engine. But uh, that's an economics issue that's important, but it doesn't change the fact that the technology for chemical rockets is there and is adequate. Uh, I do admit to a preference for liquid hydrogen once you get past Earth orbit. The only reason you use LOX kerosene past Earth orbit is because you already have that infrastructure for your launch vehicle. And that's, again, yeah, a fairly compelling economic argument in some cases. Uh, you get out to Mars, you might want to go with LOX methane because of uh, in situ availability. It's easy to make. Yes. And in deep space, the performance of hydrogen is enormous and the disadvantages of hydrogen 
I mean, you're still climbing the steep end of this curve here, so hydrogen climbing up a bit farther on that curve is huge. Uh, keeping it cold is somewhat less of a problem in space than it is on Earth. Uh, the bulk of your tanks is somewhat less of a problem. So, you know, LOX hydrogen engines will give us the inner solar system. Uh, advanced electric engines will give us a bit more payload to the inner solar system twice as much payload to the inner solar system. And honestly, if you get into the details of the orbit mechanics, you kind of want both. Mm -hmm. There are some clever schemes where, uh, I don't know, how many of you have heard of the O-Earth effect? Mm -hmm. uh, if you are doing orbital mechanics, if you're doing a maneuver anywhere near a planetary gravity well, you really want to do that maneuver instantaneously as deep in the gravity well as possible at least for velocities comparable to the, you know, the escape velocity of that planet. And when you look at uh, doing that all the way to Mars, you find that the overhead effect gives you about half of what you want, and so you sort of want to split your mission in an ideal world using a very high thrust impulsive burn right up close to the Earth, and then uh, for the rest of the for the rest, everything before and after that you do with, with the low thrust system. You actually pump up the orbit slowly over several months, staying in Earth orbit, but you know, increasingly elliptic orbit over several months. Then you want one burst of thrust at your last pass on Earth, and none of the electric propulsion systems can get you enough thrust fast enough to do that. So you need chemical rockets for that part to get to your usefulness, and then you go back to your ion thrust, your hull thrust, your vessel, or whatever for the rest of the trip. So. Yeah, that's, that's getting into the concentration of the commercial team. Yeah, it's not a huge problem. And it's a win you can get it off the shelf technology. If you kept a, if you uh, had a nuclear thermal rocket like Nerva, I guess you could use the same fuel for both. Nuclear thermal really has to be using liquid hydrogen, which, which is, is fair enough. It's a decent fuel. The hydrogen also works with uh, chemical rockets and works with the Vasmir system or solar power arms. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was thinking about the Vasmir. Yeah. Nuclear thermal gas and Vasmir is a decent combination. Uh, and if you can figure out how to make a nuclear thermal rocket, it will also be a nuclear power, power generator. I, I think I've seen some of that. There's a lot of things like that. Like that. That's, that's a hybrid rocket. Yeah. What's your question in here? And yeah, it's also. Uh, Yes and yes and no. You can always, you can always compensate, compensate for air gas or gas adjusting just in cold gas grids. Where they where they really come into play is the energy efficiency. Because you guys are playing, playing, you have to you have to ionize these gases to accelerate them. The energy the energy you put into ionizing them is well, locked. It's locked. It doesn't turn into thrust. For something for something like hydrogen. hydrogen. The energy, the energy you put in the ionizing gas atom is, is greater, greater than the energy that you put into accelerating it to right now 3,000 seconds ISP. So that's a, so that's a huge loss term. For a Z-naught, Z-naught, I'm going to put it on 30, 30. Costs about as much as I ionize the hydrogen. But, but you put on 100, 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 you put so you do so you want, want the heaviest, heaviest gas, gas you can get, yeah, yeah. heaviest, heaviest, and most most financial emissions that you can create. And that gets, and that gets you to get some great on the ground. You see, you see, you see, heavy, heavy, and it had, it had this really, really little, little, tiny, 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 Yeah, yeah. 
the biggest, biggest user of the oxygen mask is the steel manufacturer. manufacturer. And, and if you're running the oxygen mask for steel manufacturer, manufacturer in fact, you can if you can use the little tap on the calculation column and get some steel mask. You could have done it or not, or not. But unless you're running steel mill, it's not that kind of thing. So, it's so. a so, more radar on that natural and no one wants it. Uh, I'll be able to collaborate on it. Probably a few people have not just found us. Yes, radar is self ionizing. It's a little bit of your favorite. Test engineers are no longer respectable, so it's just not a good thing. They just fired the test engineers. Well, that's mostly like carbon, right? So not not like. <laughs> to a fixed infrastructure, so you've got to be making a lot of trips to and from the same place. But if you invest in the technology, you invest in the infrastructure, you get essentially a few kilometers per second of free delta B by just spinning up, spinning down tethers, maybe uh, doing some electrodynamic tether work. Yeah, it, with, with tethers, if you've got a two-way transport going, say, to the surface of the moon, yeah. it, it caught, it getting to the surface of the moon, just you go through a couple of tethers, and you expend only a couple hundred meters per second of, of rocket delta V, you get to and from the surface of the moon, yeah. it's pretty slick. Yeah, the only downside is that the technology de development and the infrastructure development are such that I don't think you can open new markets this way. And it's got its own trapeze act. Yeah. And and no net. <laughs> <laughs> and the success rate on tethers has been somewhat underwhelming. So, yeah, you get to the point where people are going back and forth to Mars, I guarantee you somebody will build a tether station to get it there a little bit faster, better, and cheaper, but it's not going to be the first ship to Mars that does this. Exactly. Okay. And that's a good thing, there's a large part of the market, the lower orbit's going to be propellants, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a cash cow. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep it that way for as long as possible. <laughs> Sorry, um, I came here a bit late. Uh, what exactly is a tether system? Okay, well, I didn't explain that. But okay. uh, basically, it's an orbit, orbiting slingshot. Mm -hmm. You got the Earth here, and you got some object in orbit about the Earth. The absolute simplest form of a tether is you have a space station. And a cable that runs maybe a thousand kilometers, you don't care about that now belts, but up and a thousand kilometers down. And the gradient in your gravitational field will keep this relatively taut. This is moving at orbital velocity. If you do the geometry of it, this part here is moving at much less than orbital velocity. This part here is moving at much greater than orbital velocity. So I can now, and Doug alluded to this uh, just a couple hours ago launch a suborbital vehicle that rendezvous with the tether here, drops off its payload, comes back down. I don't have to build a complete orbital launch vehicle. Put my payload here, take the elevator up, drop it off here, I'm already at superorbital velocity part way out to Mars. And, and you can play games even further if you spin this thing up like a pinwheel. Uh, that gets into a nightmare of dynamic complexity, but it gives you better <laughs> performance. Um, people have been flying tethers since 1961. It was done on Gemini 10, I think it was, uh, manually deployed, and it gave astronauts nightmares because they didn't do what they expected, just bounced around a lot. There have been another 30 or 40 tethers since, I think, um, 20 or 30. Mm -hmm. A third of them have been wonderful successes, a third of them, eh, we're not sure, a third of them have broken or otherwise failed miserably. So, 
I'm not betting on it. The first crew to Mars, but I'd like to see what's going on. Probably the first uh, use of them then will be, be hauling stuff up to Earth over to lower orbit. Yeah, or bringing stuff down to lower orbit from lower orbit. They turn out one of the difficulties of tethers, and particularly there's I didn't talk about it, but there's an electrodynamic version of this where you run a current through it and get some additional force out of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, basically, using it as the armature of an electric motor. Those are remarkably difficult to steer. If your mission is orbital debris removal. Steering doesn't matter so much. Down is good. <laughs> Anything vaguely down will take it into the atmosphere and it's no longer a problem, assuming we're not doing huge chunks of debris. So there's a lot of talk that the first mission for tether would be attach a tether to something that we need to deorbit, pull it down, don't worry so much about the guidance, and learn from that. And you know, that, that would be like an upper stage on something, delivering something to lower the orbit. Mm -hmm. And attached to the upper stage would be this relatively small electrically conducted tether. That yeah. After the payload's gone, you deploy the tether, and it deorbits itself in two weeks. Yeah. And it's gone. And you can, to some extent, couple that with this scheme. You have, for example, you launch into this orbit with something that has a payload and an upper stage. And as you unreal the tether, your payload winds up here. Your upper stage winds up here, uh, then you cut the tether. The upper stage falls right back down, and your payload is higher than it would have been. It's, it's a momentum transfer. You're taking some of the momentum in the upper stage and putting it into the payload. So, reduce, reduce, recycle. <laughs> yeah. I, I like tethers, but it's a part term technology. The ones we got now that work for this mission. Chemical rockets, particularly locks hydrogen for deep space, uh, Hall effect, ion, and maybe Vesner. They've, been, they've got two thirds of it working for sure. And they really need to put that thing in an orbital environment to test it. Are nuclear bombs off the table? Probably yes. There are certain inconvenient treaties about that. And the, the environmental ramifications, particularly in the space environment, for using any sort of an Orion or nuclear pulse system, uh, nightmares. It gives you Van Allen belts from hell. Yeah. And our Van Allen belts are already from Hex, so we don't. I don't want to turn into Jovian Van Allen belts. Yeah. Uh, if the aliens from Alpha Centauri invade, I'm all in favor of the Orion Drive battleship to take them out. But otherwise, not so much. 